Thank you all for attending today's webinar. My name is Lauren Izoni and I help coordinate the Agile Training Services here at CC Pace. Just a little bit about CC Pace. We are a 40-year-old IT and business consulting company specializing in the healthcare and financial services industries. We offer a full suite of business consulting capabilities, digital services, and an array of offerings under the Agile Transformation umbrella, including both certified public courses and customizable private trainings, and of course, our webinars. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to our instructor for today, Anoop. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. And uh, I would like to uh, first begin by giving a quick introduction about myself. Um, just want to make sure everyone is able to see my screen. Lauren, can, can you see my screen? It looks great. All right, great. Thank you. So, so my name is Anup Dhanorkar. I work at uh, CC Pace as an Agile coach. and uh, uh, my background has mostly been in IT with, you know, starting out uh, in uh, analyst role and then, um, you know, growing from there. I have worked in uh, uh, public as well as private sector for a number of years and uh, went through the agile transformation over the years in various uh, organizations, industries, and witnessed how the organizational culture impacts um, how agile is done i'm passionate about agile um, and i have uh, you know worked with a number of organizations in in, in their agile journey one of my uh, one of my keen interest is identifying the the hidden anti patterns that uh, you know uh, you know basically factors that influence how agile is done how an organization is being agile uh, and those factors are usually not something that are apparent. And uh, I like highlighting them and having discussions and, and bringing the organizations uh, to take action on them. So with that, uh, let's jump into the topic of the presentation today. Uh, this is uh, status versus inspect and adapt, uh, story of chicken curry. That's the name of the, the, the title of the presentation. Uh, I ha it's a story about family dinner. The the goal of this uh, uh, you know presentation is to take an event that happened in real life, uh, make it give it a fun spin, and try to connect it with how <clears throat> our interactions um, happen in our work environment and and what that does to influence our success or failure or the teams or organization success or failure. All right, so it's a story about family dinner. Let's just go through that fun story first, and then we will go through the morale and connecting the dots and whatnot. All right, so every story has characters. This is my story about my family. This is, that's me and my wife. I have two kids, both boys, seven and three. So there they are. These are the characters of the story, and you must be wondering each story has a protagonist and antagonist. Uh, so who who's the protagonist here and who's the antagonist? So, the protagonist of the story is chicken curry. And the antagonist, if you can guess, is time. These are the additional characters that we will bring into our story and see how they how, how they play their role. All right. So the, the, the story is about a typical work day, uh, you know, end of day. It was about 6.30, 7 p.m. It was a long day. During the pandemic, we were both, me and my wife, working from home. And as you can see from our faces, we were really tired and you know, kind of having a long day there. Um, and the kids were, kids were getting hungry. <clears throat> they were you know, stepping into our room and saying, hey, you know, dad, mom, dad, we're hungry. Uh, can I have something to eat? Uh, it was dinner time. <clears throat> so we decided, OK, yeah, we, I told the kids, OK, we'll be there soon. And uh, we basically wrapped up our work and uh, both me and my wife were wondering, okay, what should we do about the evening? What should we do about the dinner? And what should we do about other stuff that we have to do? So I'm gonna start using some of the technical terms 
from our work world so that we can kind of draw some of those parallels and also have fun along the way. So we were talking about what were our other priorities that we have to that we have to take care of other than the primary goal, you know, the dinner and, and feeding the kids, and obviously having you know entire family at dinner. Um, and we realized that there's there was a bunch of chores to do, and you know my wife wanted to really work on the backyard veggie patch because there was some significant rescuing to do. Otherwise, it would have gotten um, wilted somehow. Uh, so we discussed those competing priorities and we came up with a plan. Uh, and the plan was that dad will make the famous chicken curry. And I am uh, pretty good at making this chicken curry. I have been doing it since my college days, uh, almost 15 years ago. And uh, I was pretty popular among friends for my chicken curry. I continued on over the years uh, and uh, have perfected the recipe have some secret ingredients uh, and the family loves it. So, you know, when we decided that the kids were really excited about it. So the plan was dad will make the famous chicken curry and mom will go do some garden, right? So we headed our way. I went to the kitchen, uh, my wife went to the backyard, the kids followed her and uh, went to the backyard to, you know, play a little bit. This was during summertime. So it was good weather, not like today. And uh, um, so they, they played there for a while and then they got tired and they came in and you know, were watching TV in the family room. So, and uh, you know, my wife was doing her, her gardening work and I was basically busy making my, my chicken curry. I had a, a lot of uh, prep work to do. This is an elaborate chicken curry, it's not just one dish, it's basically an entire you know meal come you know it's not just chicken curry but you got to make uh, a lot of other things like uh, the bread you know we call it roti um, and uh, there is a process to prepare the sauce to prepare sauce and salad and everything so I was busy doing that and uh, my older kid was really getting hungry so he came in you know asking for uh, when the the food will be ready you know, when will the product be ready to be delivered, you know, uh, in, in, in our IT or software delivery times. And I told him, yeah, sure, just, you know, I'm, you know, almost there, almost done, just wait for a little bit. And uh, he came in at least three times, three more times, uh, checking in on, you know, how uh, dinner was coming along. And I asked him, does it smell good? He was like, yeah, it smells great. I'm hungry. And I was really excited to see that my uh, you know, the kids were, were excited and hungry about, about the dinner. Um, and uh, sometime halfway through, my wife came in, you know, she came in from the backyard and said, hey, honey, how's it going? And I said, well, basically, I, I kind of gave her, um, you know, I wanted to make sure she knew everything I was doing. So I kind of gave her all the details of all the, the spices I was using and how I had prepared the sauce and um how i had marinated the chicken and all of that and what i was going to do i told her about that as well what else i'm going to cook um and i also men mentioned cilantro because she had recommended cilantro like the last time i was making it so i mentioned that hey i'm i'm, I'm putting cilantro in there and i'm not didn't forget that wanted to make sure she's happy with that and uh you know she listened to all of that and uh, she was like uh, that's great she gave me two thumbs up and then she went back uh to to continue to do her her gardening work and i was happy you know no one was bothering me i was working at my own pace and uh, uh was able to kind of make it the way i would like to right so that continued on and uh, i basically finished uh, cooking and uh, you know setting the dinner table placed everything nicely set up i was really happy with the the outcome the product that i had uh created Asked my wife, you know, the, the, the dinner is ready. So she came in and she, you know, kind of uh, started getting ready to have dinner. And I called out to the kids. And I was like, hey, kids, dinner is ready. Um, come on over. And I got no response. I was pretty surprised. Like, what's going on? You know, these kids were like 
so hungry just a few minutes ago and now i'm calling out about dinner and you know they're not responding i was like maybe they're watching tv or anything you know some something engaging and it's not like i poured my heart and soul into making this dinner so i was not angry or anything um so I, you know i i just get called out to them in a more loving voice that you really get some better response uh and this time the older one responded he came in he sat on the, the table and then he promptly announced i'm not hungry and i was like what's going on that surprised me i mean uh, he was like ready to eat whatever i serve on the plate just a few minutes ago and now he's not hungry i can't i don't understand that it took me a few minutes to realize that you know every time he was coming into the kitchen to check in on the dinner he was activating the cookie jar because he was so hungry he he was not able to stop himself he was so hungry and you know he would come in ask about the dinner then find the cookie in, cookie jar right in front of him take one and go so i think by this time he was three large cookies down and there was no way he had any space left in his tummy to to eat anything so i kind of gave up on him and i said okay fine go ahead eat whatever you want to and uh, and, and you know you go to bed uh brush your teeth and go to bed <clears throat> and then i thought okay let me just go get the 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 younger one the little one he's uh, he's what two and a half three years old so i i went to the family room uh, you know expecting he was watching tv there to get him only to find out he was already asleep on the couch and, um, and if you're a parent of a toddler you probably know once they fall asleep it's very hard to get them up you know wake them up and have them eat dinner and i gave it my best shot i tried to wake him up but he was not budging he didn't wake up he he was just crying when i tried to wake him up so i, I kind of gave up on that as well so basically then we just you know me and my wife ended up having a sad dinner even though the the product itself was great overall our initiative was not a success so that's the conclusion of that evening now let's let's let, let's talk about what went wrong what let's try to analyze it in a more organized way the way you would you know in a work environment let's try to do some root cause analysis i'm gonna get nerdy on you so what really three questions what was the goal of the evening what were the key moments that mattered and what could we have done differently i think that should kind of reveal what you know where things went wrong right so the goal was it to make an awesome chicken curry or was it to impress my wife and kids with my culinary skills or was it that ensure entire family has a good balanced meal and pretty obvious is the the third one right that's the goal the entire family has a good balanced meal what was the key moment that could have changed the outcome was it when me and my wife were trying to decide what to do about the evening and we just made a wrong decision maybe she should have cooked and i should have you know gone out in the backyard but remember guys we make dinner every day and like lunch and dinner every day so um you know it's not that she would always make the dinner because there's you know there's a risk that i'll always fail that wouldn't be the right way of thinking right or was it that i should have been more vigilant about kids coming into the kitchen should have caught him in the act is that possible always no nope, it's not possible to do that always right remember when my wife checked in middle of the cooking and and what did i do i gave her the detailed account of what i was doing uh what i planned to do and i also tried to make her happy with you know whatever she wanted right that was basically a detailed status report i provided her we talked about all the good things i had done and and uh, you know we were all having those happy conversations about uh the work that was already done and the work that i planned to do but we completely missed the opportunity to inspect and adapt we did not talk about talk about any of the risks we were just too consumed with building the product completely missed the big picture of delivering the product to our customers 
on time the need of the customer right i mean think about this this recipe has been uh, you know it's it's a pretty standard recipe honestly it's chicken curry is a very common uh, recipe that if you google it you'll get probably thousands of results and i like i mentioned i've been making it since my college days to draw some comparisons if you are let's say a leader let's say a program team uh, program manager or or project manager or rte your team members the ones that you've hired you asked for experience you know a certain amount of experience from them so the team members have been doing the work for a number of years right they are experienced and really good knowledge workers and experts at it. Uh, second point is my wife did not need to know the details of everything i had doing i was doing and i planned on doing it's not like she asked me to change course or anything like that she listened to me ramble on providing her the status report lost me halfway through and then after listening to all of that she gave me a two thumbs up like okay i think this is going well and uh, went back to whatever she was doing so you know this the status report actually did not do any good when i gave all of that those details to her right and we did not talk about any risks to our goal because that's not the 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 most pleasant thing to talk about right so it's not the uh, first thing that comes to our mind now like i said we make dinner all the time and all that right so this is not a unique situation but just for the purpose of this conversation i am picking two uh, specific evenings when similar things happened and i you know ended up making chicken curry both times just to highlight how the outcome changed when i changed one small thing okay so a few weeks later we were in a similar situation late evening kids hungry i was uh, making chicken curry again and uh, my wife was doing another chore she was doing laundry okay and uh, halfway through uh, when my wife checked in like honey how's it going as usual we communicated differently instead of the detailed status report we brought back the forgotten character of our story the antagonist we looked at the clock and we looked at our customers which is our kids to see you know how they were and what they were doing and um we talked about okay it looks like we're kind of running late let's make a pivot let's reprioritize and we decided to deprioritize laundry i asked my wife to help me with meal prep and to get the kids started on the salad basically i asked her to engage our customers early give, give them a small piece of the product consumable piece so that they can start engaging and start uh, utilizing it what was the outcome we ended up having a nice family dinner and my chicken curry was appreciated by the entire family so i was pretty happy about that that's the uh, happy ending i wanted to make sure we don't end on like a, a sad note so we you know uh, usually have happy endings for our chicken curry initiatives so that's the end of our, our story portion let's get into some of the some of the technical discussions now of you know how can we connect the dots of what we just discussed with our uh, with our um, work life right so to apply this to our context and since the topic is status versus inspect and adapt let's first understand what they are and I, you know, with the story, I kind of uh, am inclined more towards having a better inspect and adapt type of discussion, but I definitely do not want to beat up on status aspect. Knowing the status, knowing where things are, is an important aspect of um, of delivery. Your leaders, your team members, we need to know where things are. So status is definitely important. Now, however, the interaction the meeting it goes differently in these two types of conversations the status is a one-way conversation primarily one stakeholder is providing 
the current state of progress to the other stakeholders. It's one way. And that is that is the primary. There might be some back and forth interaction in, in terms of you know asking clarification or maybe providing some small instruction. But the the central idea or the primary goal of a status meeting is a one way conversation and information dissemination, right? Whereas inspect and adapt is more of a collaborative discussion around risks and impediments. We do. You know, talk about what is the 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 progress made so far, but the focus is to inspect how things have gone so far and what are the potential issues and risks that that could be coming our way, and how do we adapt? You know, identify actionable uh, steps to mitigate those risks or resolve those impediments. That's the primary goal of an inspect and adapt discussion. Now, the the problem that I'm trying to highlight here is it's not that we should not have status meetings. It's that in an agile world where the, there is tremendous importance for inspect and adapt discussions that they make or break, you know, initiatives like I just gave an example. There are events or ceremonies that are supposed to be inspect and adapt, but they tend to become status meetings. They tend to take the form of a status meeting. So let's let's understand why that happens. Let's dig deep into the human psychology to see why it happens, and then potentially maybe we'll be able to move the needle in the right direction. So the first thing is, I mean, imagine you know, IT leaders such as program managers and you know, uh, technical uh leads uh overseeing not just a team but multiple teams working on multiple features epics projects what have you right and they are supposed to represent this entire program to you know upwards to the upper management they're supposed to be on top of things they're supposed to be able to answer any question when management upper management asks them like hey how are things going on X project or X, you know, with the X team, they should be able to answer it right there without saying, oh, let me get back to you on that. That doesn't look good, right? For these simple questions like how are things going? So there is a strong desire for lead leadership, whatever leadership it is, whether it is program leadership, team leadership, to know where things are, to know the status so that they can provide it if somebody asks. It is part of their job, right? And that's fair to to have that uh, desire to know where things are. And the way I mean, it, it can be solved since we are talking about you know why some of these inspect and adapt sessions turn to status meetings is they ask these questions during those sessions like okay I need to know where this project is, and, and you basically then get into a status related discussion. And that happens when there are no other easier, frictionless or minimal friction ways of getting that information. There is lack of transparency, right? In Agile, we have what is called BVIRs, right? Big Visible Information Radiators. And if you were in office, there would be a bunch of charts up on the walls. And now that we are remote for a couple of years, we have, you know, all of our uh, tools like Jira version one, uh, that that show everything uh, that the teams are working on and the, the state of the uh, of the progress. For example, you got the Scrum board. You have various reports that come out of it. You got the backlog, um, and you have the retrospectives there. It shows where what the progress is. There are version reports. There are releases. There are uh, visualizations that can tell you when you will be done versus when you should be done, how far behind are you, and it all depends on the data that is fed into those, uh, you know, work management systems. Now, I definitely am not in favor of micromanaging our work down to the last detail of a task level, but Agile is all about balance. 
So bringing the right amount of balance in capturing that data so that these tools can bring that information that status to people who seek that information will tremendously help with preventing inspect and adapt sessions from being becoming status meetings. Now the other aspect of why a discussions gravitate more gravitates more towards becoming a status instead of an inspect and adapt is the perception and the recognition. Now status meeting just like I provided my status to my wife right of how my cooking was going I talked about all the positive things because all the things that I had done were all positive all the good things and what I planned to do and that's what you know a person would want to talk about in a public forum want to say the positive things and get recognition for it compare that with an inspect and adapt which focuses on risks issues problems negative bad news right nobody wants to be a bearer of bad news maybe once maybe twice but they don't want to be the bearer of bad news over and over and in fact when i was and this is a number of years ago i was in, a, in, a, in an organization i was a scrum master at the time scrum of scrums i used to bring up the risks and i was pretty diligent about it at one time the rte commented when you know my team's turn came and i started speaking it was like oh anup your team always has some issues man what is it this time and uh, that was quite discouraging um, but basically it kind of shows how why people are discouraged from bringing up risks and issues in public discussions like the agile ceremonies like strong scrums and stand up and uh, you know, other agile ceremonies you know it has a negative connotation uh, if, if you are always the one who is bringing up problems so the way to i mean you know way to solve this is pretty obvious you know you gotta have an organizational culture that encourages this transparency encourages people to bring up risk issues, appreciates them so uh, it's more of a cultural aspect uh, derived from the psychological factors that drive human behavior in public forums. So those are, you know, now that we have a better understanding of what status is, what inspect and adapt is, and what causes conversations, discussions to gravitate more towards a status, let's uh, let's get a little bit tactical. You know, I, I had promised in the in the the webinar description that you know we would get a little bit tactical so that you'll have some actionable um, you know advice and recommendations that you can take back and implement so let's focus on a couple of ceremonies couple of events that uh, have the highest impact from this perspective and tend to gravitate more towards status meeting more so than others and see what we can do about them okay so daily scrum and scrum of scrums uh, it's Scrum of scrums or you know whatever that meeting is where uh, multiple teams on a program or on a initiative get together uh, to discuss and collaborate and make sure that everybody is continuing towards the goal. Okay, so daily scrum. Now daily scrum, you know the way it is. You know by the book the way it is facilitated the scrum master facilitates asks the team members to answer three questions what did you do yesterday what are you planning to do tomorrow today and uh, uh, are there any impediments or some version of that right but that's the basic idea which that structure is great actually that structure captures the progress and the risks and impediments but what ends up happening in reality in reality People tend to uh, give primarily focus on what they did yesterday and what they plan to do today. But there is always this challenge of bringing the risks and impediments that doesn't become the focus of the conversation. There's always those missed opportunities that you find out very late in the game and uh, that causes teams to miss their commitments. Things are discussed during retros as to what happened, why didn't we finish the story? Oh, this block came up and I couldn't, but we don't talk about, hey, how could we have foreseen it coming? Or as soon as it came, how could we have acted on it, planned for it? 
right? Stand-ups tend to become more repetitive and dull. I mean, you know, you talk to an, any agilist like Scrum Master, Product Owner, RTEs, they'll be, you know, very, uh, they'll have very positive things to say about stand-ups. But you talk to a developer, out of 100, you know, a majority of them would say stand-ups are like a repetitive activity that we do every morning. I don't really see a value in it. Uh, I'm not saying everyone will say that, but majority of them will give that answer. So they tend to become these status meetings where team members just provide update on what they are doing and then end their, end their input. What can you do? Well, here, here are some, you know, small recommendations. There's a number of things we can do, but I just wanted to put a few of them out there uh, to give some food for thought and, and maybe, you know, make some difference. So, and some of these are, have worked for me as well. I have, I have tried them and uh, found that they did make a difference. So one of the things I used to do was I wanted to bring my team's attention to the overall big picture because folks tend to uh, gravitate towards a task at hand, the task that they are working on on that very day or that, you know, yeah. the story that they're working on. Uh, and in agile teams, there is a tendency to lose focus on lose the focus on on the bigger picture of the entire team's goals, right? And especially now during COVID, when everyone is working from home, there is less of that face-to-face -face interaction, and that causes us to kind of we get more siloed uh, than than usual, right? So what I did was I, you know, beginning of the sprint, you were identify those sprint goals, high level, uh, two or three sentences and in plain English of what we want to accomplish during the sprint, put, I bring them up on the screen right before stand-up begins and let it hang there when people are just joining and getting ready for the stand-up. Let it be there so people get a chance to just take a look at it and their mind calibrates to the big picture, at least at that sprint level, the big picture of what is our sprint goal. And I obviously mention also that, hey guys, you know, as you provide your input, keep a focus on these sprint goals. We are trying to accomplish this as opposed to a single story or a single task. So if you are able to provide an input that will be more aligned to the goals, that will be greatly appreciated. And it made a difference. Second is I made the focus on impediments. Less about getting what you did and what you planning to do. I'm not trying to micromanage. I don't really need to know exactly what you did and what you coded yesterday. And this was me you know, speaking as a scrum master. But what I really want to know is, do you need any help? Anybody needs any help? Anybody can provide some help. Let's talk about that. And the focus was risks and impediments. Now here's another thing that is like, you know, rampant in the industry, especially in the public sector, government sector, you know, folks try to have stand-ups as early as possible in the morning. First thing in the morning, begin with stand-up, but think about the human nature. Not everybody is a morning person. I mean, I myself am a zombie until I get my first chai or coffee. So if we want to get meaningful input from people in this very critical discussion, we should give them the time to uh, get their head wrapped around where things are, where do they need help, what is the best step forward, and be able to provide that input effectively. So. I recommend this as an agile coach to the teams that, hey, stand up doesn't have to be the first thing in the morning. Feel free to move it an hour out or something. It still is to be, it needs to be a 15 minute thing where you're not just spending, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just discussing status. Make it 15 minutes. So you can carve out 15 minutes anytime during the day. Wouldn't recommend end of the day either, but you know, it doesn't have to be the first thing in the morning. And then the last one is, no scrum master facilitation necessary and that doesn't mean scrum master is not necessary in the in the in the stand up scrum master definitely should be there but they should not be driving the stand up there doesn't have to be slowly you know if you are a scrum master slowly coach your team on letting it run them, let them run it by themselves i mean going round robin is is not a skill anybody needs to to learn or uh, there's no team that really needs that round robin 
facilitation. So as a Scrum Master, I would recommend you should be focused on really jumping on the impediments or trying to make sure that focus is on impediments when, when people provide that and let the team kind of self-organize around how that the stand-up uh, is facilitated. That way, team members will address the team rather than the, the Scrum Master. So those are some, you know, tactical recommendations of how stand-ups can be improved. And if we look at Scrum of Scrums, I mean, it is, it has a lot of similarities with stand-up. And so the challenges that you will see there, the problems that gra gravitated towards becoming a status meeting are also similar. And then the possible solutions might also be similar and might look like the same for, for stand-up, but let's go through that. So for Scrum of Scrums, the setup is a slightly different, right? You have mostly team leads and you got program leads and sometimes the upper level management and stakeholders di dialing in the, in the invite list is kind of politically charged more than a stand-up invite list. So team leads, like Scrum Master product owners, they see this as, as, a, as a way to provide status report to the program management. And this is one of the, the dysfunctions in the industry is this is how Scrum Scrums is seen. The other thing is if you are, you know, if you want to be seen as an effective Scrum Master, you don't want to be bringing up problems every day. You want to show that everything is under control. Things are great. No need to escalate at this time. Escalation always means you're escalation, escalating about something, somebody, some team. And that person might be your buddy, somebody who's probably going to write your 360 degree review, performance review, right? You want to don't you don't want to burn your bridges. You want to build those uh, relationships and keep those connections. So you don't want to bring that up in Scrum of Scrums. You prefer to handle it one on one, right? So that also happens a lot in the industry. Is team leads tend to gravitate towards not wanting to make someone look bad, and it happens, it, it, it is seen as like, like making somebody look bad because the organizational culture is, if somebody has raised an, a risk or an impediment that involves you, that is making you look bad, you're basically uh, causing uh, a hindrance to the progress. However, it should not be seen as such. The organizational culture needs to really promote highlighting risks and impediments as early as possible, and also not treating it as uh, as as a negative for the parties involved. It is like I said, politically charged meeting, right? So a lot of organizations I have seen they maintain the invitees pretty tight. They they try to keep it to a limited number of folks who know what they should be saying and what they should not be saying because you never know who's gonna dial in. You know, uh, in, in public sector, you got clients and contractors and competing contractors dialing into these meetings. So you want to be careful about what you say. And I understand reality on the ground. However, if we really want to accomplish the true essence of Scrum of Scrums, it is important to, again, address that organizational culture and the dogma around uh, wanting to keep, uh, you know, the, the message uh, and protect the message and make sure nobody looks bad and focusing more on bringing transparency. If we are focused on that, there, there, will, there are always conversations that uh, require people, you know, team members who are not the usual invitees on Scrum of Scrums. You would want a developer who's working on a particular story that is facing an impediment and in order to have a meaningful conversation about that impediment you want the developer to be chiming in right to be explaining things of what they are facing right oftentimes they are not invited for fear of you know you never know what they might say they're not you know uh, uh usual participants of the meeting and don't know the participants and all the politics around it that leads to a lot of dysfunction. That leads to uh, issues not getting resolved on time, team members getting affected by impediments that take too long to take action on. 
discussion during scrum of scrums uh, mostly uh, not about being actions but about oh let's take it offline let's have a follow-up discussion sound familiar so you need the right people in there and oftentimes and uh, scrum scrums become one of the informational flow each team you know just providing about what they are working on with stories how many stories are there how far they are what their burn down looks like uh, and it's a one-way conversation so what can we do to improve just like standards i would say you know even for scrum of scrums focus on blockers and risks and the way i have seen it work is instead of bringing a bunch of other information on the screen if you're working all remotely and you know sharing screen and using that as a way to kind of keep everybody focused bring the list of risks and issues on the screen and keep the conversation centered around that second is encouraging transparency uh, similar uh, advice just like the standards but here um, this you know goes for a different set of stakeholders right uh, program leadership upper management really needs to encourage this transparency and uh, appreciate the folks who are bringing that transparency because those are tough conversations those are difficult conversations to have when you bring up a problem now accelerate communication using your tools uh, oftentimes you come to scrum scrums and somebody is introducing a risk that was identified a day two days ago you know they identified it and they're like okay the scrum scrum says tomorrow i'll just mention it there and then they're bringing it up and then folks are learning and getting introduced to it at that point and then you know the scrum scrum is again a time box meeting so if you are just getting introduced to something haven't had time to think about it maybe have uh, take some action around, you know, digging it a little bit deeper, have some conversations. Too. There is no way for you to have a conversation around resolution or provide something meaningful, useful as a response. And in order to accomplish that, my, my recommendation is if you identify risks, communicate them right away, use tools such as Jira to raise them and also set expectations if you're an RTE set that expectations from your scrum master say you know if you, if you have risks enter them uh in in whatever tool you're using jira rally uh or whatever risk management tool you're using <clears throat> have a minimum set of information that is absolutely needed what is the risk what is the impact what are the potential possible solutions what have you done so far what has worked what has not worked uh who are the pocs potential points of contact that you've already reached out to to have that information in there. Also set the expectations from other participants to review this before Scrum of Scrums so that they're not coming into Scrum of Scrums completely with a blank mind. They're already up to speed on what it is and then the discussion can actually move forward from there. So that facilitation is key, uh, which includes setting the right expectations from the participants. But at the same time, it's also important to have that information accurately captured, sufficient detail in these tools so that when you set those expectations, they actually make a positive impact. And then pull in the right people. Bring in the developer if, if, if uh, they are the ones who should be providing the input. You know, Scrum Master doesn't have to have a conversation with the developer, get everything, write notes, and then regurgitate them in the scrum scrums and then finally end up with all right let's have a follow-up discussion offline conversation about this bring in the right people and have a conversation that leads to action so these are uh, you know some suggestions there is a million other things that we can do to improve things but i wanted to make sure that at the end of this you have something actionable to take with you uh, so, you know, these are some things that I have seen help me personally in my uh, in my role when I was uh, Scrum Master and RTE. Um, and hopefully they will help you as well. So, if there's one thing from this entire presentation, entire webinar that I presented, that you can take back with you, just one thing that's 
don't forget to add cilantro to your chicken curry if you ever cook one. All right, folks. Hopefully, it was a useful conversation and presentation. If you have any questions, uh, Lauren, let me know if there are any questions. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and um, you know put them in the question box. Um, Anoop, our first question is, what can Scrum Masters do if management is more inclined to get status during the ceremonies? That's a great question. So, and I have experienced this myself, uh, there is a tendency from, and you know, that's a good use of words, management, right? Management could include anybody, folks who are directly involved and are connected day-to-day -day basis. And there are, there could be folks who are not as directly connected. They might be at a much higher level and, uh, um, and, and they don't have as much uh, interaction to really be uh, aware of everything that's going on. So one important thing is to recognize the need for status, to not see it as a negative aspect, to understand that, yes, it is important for our leaders to know what the status is. And then uh, figure out, you know, and also kind of give it a, a good thought around what is it that they want to know so that they can do their job better. What are the pieces of information they would like to know? And use the a, existing tools or available tools that you have at your disposal to communicate that out. Providing communication is one of the important responsibilities of a Scrum Master's job. That includes providing the status. So if you, if you realize that your management is hungry for status and that is causing your, uh, you know, critical events to turn into status meeting. The way to resolve that is to provide that information, make it available readily, frictionless to them so that they don't then ask for it. Right? Some of the ways I already discussed, like have your tools, you know, updated with that information, such as if you're using Jira or Rally, you know, have your stories, have your tasks properly updated so that whatever reports come out of that glean that information that they are looking for. And additionally, whatever information you have to provide that cannot be provided quantitatively from numbers, figure out a way to get that information to them. If that means you type up an email, so be it. You know, do keep it lightweight, not detailed status reporting, uh, status reports that uh, are, are uh, you know, brutal to read. But uh, keep it lightweight, keep it concise, and at a regular basis, provide those updates as a way to make sure that they have those handy and are not asking for it. Because when it gets asked for, you do have the ability to say that I, you know, I sent that email, I sent that you know, lightweight report uh, that provided all this information, or you can follow up with that and sl slowly make an impact on how your ceremonies are, are getting facilitated. Hopefully that helped answers. Okay, great. Um, another question is, how do you improve the risk management aspect in team discussions? Right, so I, so I think the question is more about like, you know, team discussions, team members are not bringing risks and um, basically just providing the, the cookie cutter stand up input of what they did yesterday, what they did today. Uh, or even other team discussions where mostly the focus is on providing, you know, the work being done versus what could go wrong. Uh, that's more of a cultural thing and a coaching aspect. You know, I would recommend if you have agile coaches, uh, you know, on your, in your organization, work with them and have them, you know, coach the team on uh, bringing issues uh, earlier to everybody's attention, coach the team on how to do it more respectfully and, uh, efficiently uh, sometimes folks are just uh, feel feel that it is an uncomfortable conversation to have to to make someone look bad and they just don't want to bring it up uh, it's better to just not not say it and then uh, maybe have a ping separately maybe ping the scrum master separately see if that resolves it or maybe not do anything uh, it's an uncomfortable inconvenient conversation to have so it's more of a coaching thing. I would recommend coach your team members 
or provide them with ways that are less uh, less awkward for them to bring up you know ability to create a risk in in your tools if that's possible or uh, have some you know shared space where they can go ahead and write their concern uh, using the right words instead of calling things problems or issues you could call them concerns or potential headwinds you know use soft language these things have a big impact on how people communicate uh, so recognize the importance of uh, of all those factors and uh, bring factor in the cultural aspect uh, into coaching hopefully that helps answer the question okay great that is all of our questions that have been submitted um so with that i think we're all set thank you so much anu um for this session today thank you thank thanks you thank you everyone for attending thanks everyone